We had approximately 73,562 people request Carnotaurus, and one of our viewers, Henry, was nice enough to send in this beautiful sculpture of Carnotaurus. Like, I want to call it a statue. It's not really a toy anymore. It's so pretty. Uh, this is probably the most accurate toy we've had on the show so far. Uh, if you look at this, you would, you would come away with the various features that you would want to know about Carnotaurus. You've got this, the short, deep snout, the two horns on its head, the tiny arms the athletic long legs, the muscular tail, and the, and the rows of ridged scoots running down its back. It's exactly the kind of toy I would like to see on this show. That doesn't mean that there aren't things wrong with it that I'm going to talk about. Uh, also, Carnotaurus is probably the n most recently discovered dinosaur we've had on the show. Uh, it was discovered in 1984, described 1985 and 1990, all by Jose Bonaparte. Uh, from Argentina, if that, that might have been redundant, since it would be easier to name dinosaurs from Argentina that Jose Bonaparte has not named. Because it was so recently discovered, Carnotaurus never had to go through that phase that a lot of the other dinosaurs on this show have gone through, where they're, you know, depicted as plotting lizard Godzilla monsters. Uh, that said, Carnotaurus is often portrayed more like a standard, whatever that means, theropod, with two horns on its head, which isn't fair to it. Even back in the late 80s, early 90s, when workers were still lumping all large theropods into Carnosauria, which we now know is not accurate, but even with that broad brush that they were painting with in the early 90s, they recognized that there was a difference between the meat eaters that they were finding in the southern hemisphere and the meat eaters that they found in the north. See, this is from the Cerro Barcino formation, which is about 83 million years ago to 72 million years ago. So this would have been a contemporary of Gorgosaurus and Aspletosaurus and Parasaurolophus and Chasmosaurus and that group of dinosaurs in North America, but it would never have met them because South America was isolated at this time. So the animals were getting very strange there. We talked last time about endemism, the uniqueness of animals in different parts of the world. The late Cretaceous, we saw high diversity. We saw very different animals, even between the two Americas. Carnotaurus is a good example of this. Uh, the theropods that you see in America were fluffy. They were Silurosaurs, they were, they were the Tyrannosaurs, which we now know would have probably had proto feathers. Whereas Carnotaurus is the poster child for a scaly large body theropod. This was the first theropod, uh, non-avian theropod, that we found with skin impressions. Uh, the holotype had skin impressions all along the side of its body. It even had it on the head, but we destroyed it digging up the skull because we didn't realize what we had at the time. That happens sometimes. But it's a good thing we have those skin impressions because without them we wouldn't know about these rows of armor-ridged scales going down its back. Uh, it was photographs in the original description, as well as a description by the sculptor, uh, Stephen Cherkas, uh, that, uh, that explains what these would have looked like. It would have had over most of its body standard dinosaurian scales, reticula, uh, tuberculate scales, which is, looks like what you have on the bottom of a bird's foot or on the bottom of this toy's feet. Uh, <laughs> And those would have been about half a centimeter in size, but then they would have been interrupted in irregular rows by much larger, like 10 times larger, ridged scales uh, that sort of resemble the armor on the back of a crocodile. And the scales, like on this toy, would be getting larger as you approach the top of the animal. 
And it's really a shame that we lost those skin impressions from the head because the head presents a little bit of a mystery. There's this ridged texture on the nasal bones, which is usually restored this way, like on the toy where it's got these keratin spikes. Uh, but it's also sometimes been restored as just a wrinkly texture skin or even some kind of comb. But the keratin spikes make the most sense, really, especially if you consider the things it might be using the horns on its head for. A final note on integument, this toy has what you see in a lot of theropods, which is the bird-like scoots on the foot. There actually isn't much evidence for those showing up outside of the, the birds because, developmentally, those scoots are suppressed flight feathers. So unless the animal is descended from a creature that had flight feathers on its feet, it's probably not gonna have those scoots. It would just have those reticulated scales all over the foot. Another comparison we can make with tyrannosaurids is the tail and, and to an extent the legs. Uh, there were two researchers who in 2010 did a rather popular study about the tail muscles of Tyrannosaurus and how those would help it with its locomotion. They followed that up with a study on Carnotaurus in 2011. Uh, well, really a study on many Abelosaurids or Carnotaurines. The caudal ribs on the tail vertebra of Carnotaurus are ridiculous. In most dinosaurs, those are just simple rod-like structures that extend laterally out from the sides of the vertebra. In Carnotaurus and in other derived Carnotaurians and Abelosaurids, they're these broad blade-like structures that extend diagonally upwards. Now, what in the world would those be for? Well, they have muscle scars on the bottoms. So they're anchoring this huge muscle called uh, Caudofemoralis longus, which attaches to the back of the femur. Now, that is interpreted by the researchers as an adaptation for pulling the leg back. And that shows up in all theropods, but in Carnotaurus, they are ridiculously huge. They're the largest proportional to their body of any th known theropod. So when you have the tail that's, you know, about the same width as the hip bones, that, that's an animal that's not gonna be able to run. You, you need to have it wider than the hip bones, and by some estimates, if you're not being too conservative, much wider than the hip bones. So really the tail isn't just a counterweight, it's a lever. It, it creates a moment arm around the hip joint to pull the leg back to propel the animal forward. There's a trade-off in that though. As you tilt those caudal ribs upwards, you have less room for the muscles that need to go on top of them. And those are the muscles that keep the tail stable. The solution that Abelosaurids came up with was to interlock their caudal ribs, which stiffens the tail, but reduces its ability to flex. So in a simplified RPG-like way, they were trading maneuverability for raw acceleration. Because instead of doing that serpentine flexi turning thing that other theropods would be able to do, they were instead it, was, it would be like trying to turn quickly while carrying a long board parallel to the ground. Now that implies some things about the environment in which they were living. That tells us that they probably didn't need to be super maneuverable. That means that they weren't, you know, living in a dense forest. They were out on a floodplain, for example. As of 2013, the Abelosaurids in South America are grouped into the Carnotaurines, and they are more closely related to each other than they are to the Abelosaurids elsewhere, which go all the way from India, Madagascar area to France and Morocco, and those are the Majungasaurids. Now, because the specimen of Carnotaurus was incomplete, we don't have any of the leg below the knee, but based on a related animal called Alcosaurus, we know that the Carnotaurines were probably leggier than the Abelosaurids elsewhere in Gondwana. So the leg that that huge caudofemoralis longus muscle was pulling back on uh, was long enough to produce a speedster, a, a, a pursuit predator, as opposed to what we figured the rest of the abelosaurids were, which is ambush predators, uh, animals that were capable of lunging, but not really of sprinting. 
And it looks like the lunging ability rather than the sprinting ability was the ancestral condition of Abelosaurids, which is interesting because that might be how they were able to survive in the early Cretaceous. When they were living in the shadow of, you know, the giant Carnosaurs and the giant Megalosaurs, uh, uh, they were able to be ambush predators going after the smaller, faster animals. Then, once the big giants die out and they have to go after the slightly larger animals, they develop pursuit abilities. And I think the legs are a little too short. Uh, the calves are too beefy, at least. And I don't know of any studies on intermetatarsal movement in a ceratosaur, but the foot here looks like it's twisted a little too much, which might just be what they had to do to get it into this nice dramatic pose, but it, it doesn't seem like something its foot would be able to do, at least not without hurting itself. I like how the feet are deforming against the ground. It, it implies the weight of the creature. Um, it was only a medium-sized theropod by Cretaceous standards, but, you know, that's comparing it to Tyrannosaurus rex, where it's only a quarter size of the Tyrannosaurus rex. But that's still a really big carnivore. And with all that talk about pursuit predation, you're probably wondering what they were pursuing. And to answer that, we need to look at faunal turnover in the late Cretaceous. The Americas before the Cenomanian Turonian boundary were pretty much an exaggeration of the animals that we saw in the late Jurassic. Now, after that boundary, the giant predators disappear. They're either rare or absent. It was the ceratosaurs, the, the mid-sized abelosaurids, that took the top spot as apex predators. What it was hunting was small to medium-sized ornithopods, derived titanosaurs, like the saltosaurids, and we had thyreophorans, which were getting weird because they were no longer stegosaurs, they were ankylosaurs. The device with which it hunted those animals? This weird head for which it is named. It's Carnotaurus, which means meat bull, based on how it has meat-eater teeth and bull-like horns. The head is so astonishingly squat. It, it's deep, but it's, there's, there's almost as much head behind the eye as there is head in front of the eye. In fact, this toy might have too long of a snout. It's definitely too wide. The, the head should be narrower side to side. Uh, it does have some binocular field of view on the eyes, not as much as if a Tyrannosaur would have, but still respectable binocular field of view. It can see what it's biting. Its mouth did have this odd upward curve in the front. You see that in some other Abelosaurids, but none so pronounced as in Carnotaurus, which is going to be a running theme here. The teeth are accurately unimpressive. It would have had relatively weak teeth. Um, it made up for those weak tooth crowns by having an overbuilt skull, and its skull was actually um, a little bit mobile. It could open its mouth on the top relative to the back of its head, so it could get a slightly wider gape without having to move its eyes. Also helping with the gape is that up curve in the front. And when I say gape, that's how wide it can open its mouth which directly affects how large of an animal it can engage. So we have this picture of a very specialized, or at least unique, head that's acting as a blunt instrument to be propelled by the legs and tail into whatever it's aiming at. The horns on top of that head I have seen pretty much restored every which way. The bony cores are not this blade-like. They actually have, if you look at them in front view, they have a parabolic cross-section. This restoration shows them coming to a point. I've seen restorations where they're just nubs. Uh, I've seen restorations where they're pointing forward like a bowl. I'm sure all have their reasons. I haven't seen any real literature on what shape is most likely. I've seen a little bit of literature on what it might be using them for, however. Uh, Horns are not uncommon in the theropods, especially in the ceratosaurs, but Carnotaurus has the largest by far, so it must have been important to it. The most obvious answer is display. If you're investing all of those resources into growing horns, that's showing how healthy and fit of an individual you are, both to potential rivals and to potential mates. They could very well be for intraspecific combat. You know, uh, there's reconstructions of them rutting like deer to compete for mates or to compete for territory. 
I haven't seen any literature on whether they could use their horns for predation, even though that might make sense if you're going after prey that's larger than you, even though we don't think it was. I, I'd, I'd like to see someone look into that, because I can't think of any other animal that has long, sharp things on its head other than maybe the saber-toothed cats, but that's not really a fair comparison. The neck on this toy might not be robust enough. Now, I, I realize it looks super beefy, um, but for example, this dip here is exactly matching a dip that shows up in the skeleton, whereas in life that probably would have been smoothed over by flesh. Because in Abelosaurids, and especially in Carnotaurus, the neck was exceedingly muscular. There's these bones called epipophyses, or at least they're a process on the bones. It's a part that sticks out over the part that articulates with the next neck vertebra. And those are muscle attachment points, and those show up in all archosaurs, but in the abelosaurs they're huge. So we figure that those were anchoring very strong neck muscles, as was the shoulder girdle. It's got these tiny little arms, but this still full-size set of shoulder blades and coracoid bones. So if it wasn't using the shoulder girdle to support the arms, it might have just retained it as an anchor point for its large neck muscles to pilot and aim this blunt instrument of a head. I have mentioned these short little arms repeatedly. Honestly, I think on this toy, they're actually too big. Like These look like functional arms which is not what Carnotaurus had. It had vestigial arms. This is very different from what you see in like Tyrannosaurus. Tyrannosaurus had very small arms, but they were still functional. Whereas on Carnotaurus, which mind you, had the smallest arms of any dinosaur that we know of relative to its body size, uh, the arms below the elbow and possibly below the shoulder were vestigial. They wouldn't have been useful for anything. Um, they've restored it with longer fingers than it probably should have. Uh, and the fingers look like they could actually do things, which I don't think is accurate. Also, they've painted four claws, which no archosaur had four claws. Even if it had, you know, four or five fingers, it would have only had maximum three claws. We're a little unclear on the actual digit arrangement of Carnotaurus. The skeleton was disarticulated, and usually we would look at, you know, a related animal like uh, Alcosaurus or whatever, and we have, but hands in Abelosaurids are really weird. See, they were freed from their constraint of having to actually handle things, so the mutations started to pile up over the generations. One of its digits was just a spur of bone. Uh, this is usually restored as the fourth digit poking back and up. The third digit is actually the longest, uh, and the first digit is super tiny. We're not actually sure whether the third digit had a claw, but it looks like it would have. Because they weren't using their arms for predation, in all ceratosaurs you see this pattern of having your arms reduced over time. Um, the abelosaurids, though, take this to an extreme, especially Carnotaurus. So there must have been some kind of pressure within the animal itself, leading it to not invest a lot of resources into the arms. The point I'm trying to get to with all of this is that it's pretty unreasonable to restore the arms with this, you know, implied functionality here. Whereas, you could, at an equal level of unreasonableness, restore them just encased within the flesh of the chest and shoulder area, and then you would save some sculpting and painting time. So be smart with how you're going to break with reality. So. Carnotaurus, not just your standard theropod with horns on its head. It's, it's a very unique animal and a very good indicator of the diversity of life in the late Cretaceous. Really, it's an example of what happens when greatness is thrust upon an animal. So it does the best it can within the constraints of its family. I want to thank Henry again for giving us this toy. I will be sending it back to you presently. Thank you for your patience. And thank all of you for watching Your Dinosaurs Are Wrong. Please comment in with dinosaurs you'd like me to have on the show. Uh, you could even send me a toy dinosaur. Our address is in the description. If you would like your dinosaur back, please indicate that. And we'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.